Amen. So tonight, we're going to be talking about knowing God's will. So let's start with a little participation, okay? A little participation. How many of you tonight would say, have ever sought to know God's will, are in the process of knowing God's will, or you would want to know God's will in the future? Raise up your hand. All right, a lot of people. Good, I'm glad. Um, If you're a Christian tonight, I think it's only a matter of time that you have to learn how to hear from the Lord to know what the will of God is for you. And I believe that knowing the will of God is one of the most important aspects in a Christian life. What's God's will for me right now? What's God's will for me tomorrow? What's God's will for me a year from now? We need to seek the will of God. In between now and heaven, now and all eternity, it, it, it might seem or feel as if trying to learn the will of God can be somewhat mysterious, right? Yeah, anybody ever felt that way? It's like, oh, I don't know God's what's so hard. I'm wrestling with this. Some think that finding the will of God is some type of mystical, esoteric, very difficult thing. And let me just share t- with you tonight that it doesn't need to be that way. Knowing the will of God ought not to be difficult, but rather a normal aspect in the life of a Christian and a relational relationship with Christ. Knowing God's will. You know, I think of it this way. I think of it like the aspect of relationship. You know, in all relationships, there's communication. You talk, you build connection, you begin to know one another. I know with my wife and I, as we began to court and pray about marriage, we began to know and share our hopes, our dreams, our desires. And as as we're married now for 28 years, there's some communication that doesn't even need to happen. We just know. And if you've been married for a while, you know what I'm saying, right? I can look at my wife and I just know by her eyes what she's doing. She'll kind of look at me. I'll be like, oh, wow, it's time to go, right? (laughs) I, I, I have to be a little bit more obvious, you know, with my wife. I got to kind of like, okay, babe, come on. It's time. But man, you learn these things, and it's the same way with the Lord. There's aspects in which it, it, communication with him and knowing what he wants should be very plain and simple. Other times, it might require more time or consideration. Again, sometimes, when it comes to the will of God, it somewhat like a sign in the sky. You know, you want like it to be written out in in, in the sky for God to say, open that door, close, yes or no. Uh, There was a a farmer who became an evangelist, and this is kind of interesting story. He was working his farm one day, and it was hot, it was exhausting, and turning the ground and doing all the things that farmers do. And so he went into a tree to just just take a break, and he gets out his hanky and wipes his head, and he's sitting there, and he begins looking up in the sky, and in the sky through the clouds he noticed that the clouds formed two letters, the letter P and the letter C. And he thinks, God's speaking to me. God wants me to go on the road and preach Christ, P-C, preach Christ. So he sells everything that he has, and he goes on the road, and the guy just struggles miserably. It's like no one gets saved. He's struggling. No finances are coming in. And at one point in time, he ends up in his own hometown. And after a night of preaching, his friend comes up to him and says, hey, have you ever considered the words in the sky just meant to plant corn? PC, plant corn. <laughs> Sometimes we think or feel or believe that we need a sign in the sky. But Paul says here in fresh. Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16, 17, 18, as he writes to the church in Thessalonica, he gives us three short one-line verses. And from these short verses, they come in a form of a command, if you will. And these one-line verses, they encompass God's will for daily living. In other words, what God wants from you tonight. You can know God's word right, God's will right now. And not only did these apply to the church in Thessalonica, it applies to Calvary Church here in Aurora. It applies to you. So if you raised your hand earlier about knowing God's will, wanting to know God's will, want to know what he has for you, then tonight we need to give careful consideration, a listening ear, and hear what the Spirit might say to us. So what did Paul say to the church in Thessalonica? Well, look what it says. Verse 16, 17, and 18. Paul says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And everything, give thanks. For this is the will 
of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, Paul continues with this idea and this thought in verse 19. So let's just read a couple more verses. Don't quench the spirit. Don't despise prophecy. Test all things. Hold fast to what's good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now, these verses that we read, we're only going to look at the first three that, that we read. These are all present active imperatives. Present active imperatives. In other words, what they are is that they are commands that Paul is giving the church. Commands that we are called to follow, believe, and live out. And so we're going to look at these first three commands tonight. And these three focus on the will of God for daily living. In other words, what God wants us to be doing each day as we seek to live for him. And so these three commands, they can and they will greatly bless your life if you seek to hear the word and apply it to your life. So what are the three commands? Number one is to rejoice always. Number two is to pray without ceasing. And lastly, it is to give, always give thanks in the Lord. Now, let me just say a few things before we jump into our text. One of the things that you'll notice with these characteristics that Paul gives to the church in Thessalonica is that they all predominantly take place inside one's mind and one, inside one's heart. They're internal. You see, long before these are actionable, actions to do, God desires right attitude in the inward parts first. And that's important. It's important for you to hear this tonight. And let me explain this a little bit further, because Jesus talked about this, this idea of the inward parts, the mind and the heart being set right before the Lord. Um, One of the things that Jesus taught was a distinction between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. Have you guys ever heard that before, the letter of the law and the spirit of the law? Anybody? A few people? Okay, so so tonight this might be new. And he makes a distinction between the two. What's the letter of the law and the spirit of the law? You know, we're told in the Old Testament, when you go back and you read the Mosaic commands, the Mosaic law from Moses, you think of like Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, the commands, right? One of those commands is thou shalt not commit adultery, right? We know that. But Jesus goes on further to explain not just the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. Okay, let me give you an example. Jesus talks about this in Matthew 5, verse 27 through 28. Jesus says this. He says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. Pause. We know this, right? How many of you guys ever heard that command? All right, some of you guys are with me tonight. Good. We know that command. I mean, every good Jew knew that. Don't touch another woman that's not yours. Wrong. Wrong. Bad, especially if you're married or if they're married, it's wrong. And it's very simple to say, okay, I'm not going to go do that. And we know the consequence of that was very great. So it was very, it was very minimized, that sin. But Jesus says this next in verse 28. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You see, what begins in the mind and in the heart is what becomes actionable through our lives, the fruit that comes out of our lives. It always starts with an inward attitude before we take substantial action. So as we look at these verses and we talk about them, as we seek what God's will for us right now, realize that it's the attitude of the mind and heart that God wants to apprehend it from us tonight. Okay, so let's look at these commands that Paul gives. Starting in verse 16, Paul says, Rejoice always in the Lord. Rejoice always in the Lord. This is a wonderful word from God for us today. To be those that rejoice always in the Lord. If anyone here has an old school King James, a thousand of these and those, right? It says, Rejoice evermore. Rejoice evermore. The literal translation is to to be one that always is rejoicing continually. Tonight, it is the will of God for you to rejoice always in the Lord. I find it interesting because joy is something that we and the world uh, have always longed for, and yet it seems so difficult to attain, so hard to apprehend this idea of, of happiness. And you gotta ask, well, why? 
You know, we're told to have to have joy all the time, and yet when we look at the world, it seems like they struggle with that so often. And I believe it's this. I believe that mankind from the very beginning has always lived with the pursuit of trying to, to seek happiness, of finding contentment with this world. All people want this. All people seek this. I, I would say more now than ever, people want to be happy. They want to be happy in life. You see it throughout the world, people do. You look, just look at the cartoons. If you watch any of the cartoons, movies with the kids, all of them have this storyline where they live happily ever, what? After. Even movies are like that. Even like revenge movies where, you know, they did this to me and I'm going to go back after them. The idea uh, is at the end of the movie that justice is served. The wrongs have been made right. We see this in our country. We see this in the American dream of prosperity and success. It's even written in our very constitution in our country. It goes like this. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Again, in our culture, man seeks happiness through many different ways beauty or fame or position or possessions, and yet so many come up short, empty, unfulfilled, dissatisfied, disillusioned, even when some of these things seem to be attained. Take, for example, a guy by the name of Marcus Persons. Anybody here know who Marcus Persons is? Anybody? Not one person. Marcus Persons. You may not know him by name, but you'll know him by his creation. Something he made, he created. If you're a parent of a kid anywhere from 7 to like 20, 23, 24, you'll know this because Marcus Person was the creator of this game called Minecraft. Anybody heard that game, that game Minecraft? It's a fun game. I played it with my kids. I mean, hours. I'm like making things like, no, the zombie's going to get you. And you're like using these swords you create, and it's a fun game. It was released in 2011. Within four years' time, by 2014, it was a world phenomenon of a game. Because in 2014, Microsoft decided to buy that game for Marcus for two and a half billion dollars. Two and a half billion dollars. Instantly, Marcus Persons became a billionaire overnight. And you can imagine what you do with billions of dollars. He bought homes that were over $70 million, traveled to exotic locations, spent millions on cars. And as you listen to his expression of his wealth, he says this, and I quote, the problem with getting everything is you want to run out of reasons to keep trying. And human interaction becomes impossible due to imbalance. I can hang out with my friends in Ibiza, Spain. I party with famous people. I do whatever I want, whenever I want, buy whatever I want. I found a great girl, but she's afraid of me and my lifestyle and went with a normal person instead. Unfulfilled, dissatisfied, empty. He has more wealth and finances than everybody in this room or this city combined. And we ask the question, why is that the case? It's the case because there's a distinction that has to be made between happiness and joy. And mankind has been pursuing happiness and comes up empty. Happiness, by definition, is this. It's defined by man as an attitude of satisfaction and delight based on present circumstance. It's emotionally based and driven on the happenings and the happenstances of life. In other words, when things go your way and in your favor... Your happiness is then experienced. However, when the tides turn, the difficulties come, the trials, hardships, suffering, your happiness quickly fades away and it's gone. Let me make it clear. Happiness in and of itself is not sinful or wrong or unbiblical. In fact, God created us with the ability to experience happiness, the emotion of happiness, 
In fact, there's some scriptures that back this up. Let me just give you a couple very quickly, okay? The first is Psalms 144, verse 15. It says this, the famous psalm, you know this. Happy are the people who are in such state. Happy are the people whose God is their Lord. You guys have heard that before? So, uh, John 13, 17, this is Jesus speaking. He says, if you know these things, all the things that he was teaching and saying, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Again, that word happy, whether it's in the Hebrew in the Old Testament or Greek in the New Testament, it's just the word that we use today as blessed. You know, someone says, how's your day going? Man, I'm blessed. I'm just happy today. I'm blessed today. And it com- uh, communicates this idea of happiness and thankfulness. Now, joy and the ability to rejoice, because the word joy and rejoice are the same word. Joy is much different than happiness. And it's vital that we as Christians, as believers, grasp and understand what biblical spiritual joy is and where this joy comes from. Now, if you were to pull out your phone or you were to flip out into a dictionary, flip into a dictionary, and you look up the word joy, unfortunately, the definition that you're going to read or find will leave you dissatisfied, okay? I looked it up in the American Webster's Dictionary, and this is the definition of joy from the dictionary. It says this, the emotion invoked by well-being, success, or good fortune, by the prospect of possessing what one might desire or delight. It is the expression or exhibition of such emotion. It's gaiety. It's the state of happiness or felicity or bliss, a source or cause of delight. It just comes up short from what a true and biblical and spiritual joy is. Why does it come up short? Because it's man's attempt to describe what it can only be given by God. Joy, true joy, is something that can only be experienced in the Lord. So what is that? What is biblical joy for us to be the people that rejoice always? Well, let me give you my definition that I wrote out. My explanation of what biblical spiritual joy is. It's this. Spiritual joy is the settled conviction that God is in control. Spiritual joy is not an attitude dependent on chance or circumstance, but rather a deep and abiding confidence, hope, and faith that regardless of the circumstance in life, that all is well between the believer and God. Yes, the emotion of happiness at times can be experienced in this joy, but true biblical and spiritual joy supersedes based on the nature and the character of God and the sure promise found in his word. That is what biblical joy is. And let me tell you tonight that this joy ought to be the defining character in the life of the Christian, in your life and in my life. Jesus taught us, Jesus said to us in John 15, 11, that these things I have spoken to you, his words that you have in your Bible, these things he has given to us that his joy may remain in us and that that joy may be full in us. Jesus tells us and calls us not just to have joy, but for that joy to be overflowing in our life. So here's the question. Why does it seem or feel that so many in the church today wrestle with the lack of joy? Why do we lack in this area of our lives? Again, again, if, if we think that joy is brought through hap, our, our joy is brought through happiness, we're mistaken. And we will always come up empty. And so we're commanded to have this joy, right? Rejoice always in the Lord. And some Christians might say, well, how do I do that? Because it's the command. Paul's commanding the church in Thessalonica, the Christians there, the church that he planted. Guys, walk in joy. You're going through persecution. Walk in joy, always. He also gives that command to the church in Philippi, another church he planted. And to the church in the, the letter to the Philippians, he writes in chapter four, verse four, he says, rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. Again, that word rejoice is the same word as joy. So how do we get this Christian biblical joy How do we live this out? How do we grasp this and understand this? Well, let me give you four practical truths really quick. Okay, if you're taking notes, you can write these down. Four important truths as it relates to joy. Number one, it's to know that joy is more than a feeling. Joy is more than a feeling. Christian joy can be experienced through emotion, 
but not always. That's important. Christian joy can be experienced through emotion, but not always. It's very similar to biblical love. See, biblical love can be expressed through emotion, but it's not dependent on emotion. It is rather becomes a choice, a conscious and intentional decision to love, to walk in joy. And joy is experienced in the soul of the believer in Christ. Joy becomes something we choose to pursue, a decision to follow after, a choice of obedience through faith, hope, and love. So joy, biblical joy, again, it's more than emotion of the feeling. Secondly, biblical joy is produced by the Holy Spirit. This is key. Biblical joy is produced by the Holy Spirit. It's not something that I can just make happen. I can just, I'm going to squeeze it out. There it is. I got joy. It doesn't happen that way. Okay? It's not something you can manufacture in the flesh. No, it is a byproduct of a life that is surrendered and submitted to the Holy Spirit. Did you catch that? Biblical joy is a byproduct of your life, my life, being surrendered and submitted to the Holy Spirit. You see, if we're not submitted and and surrendered, maybe that might be the area of why some Christians are not experiencing the joy they, they should be experiencing. You see, Paul gives this a little bit further in the book of Galatians. He talks about this in Galatians. And in Galatians chapter 5, he tells the Christians there about the distinction between walking in the Spirit and walking in the flesh. You guys familiar with that? He tells us, walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then what he does is that he gives us the instructions on the distinction between the flesh and the Spirit. And he gives us the list of the things of the flesh. Don't do that, but do this. Don't walk in your nature, walk in the Spirit. And remember what he says there, the fruit of the Spirit is love, and the second one is what? Joy. Don't do this, do this. Don't live in this way, live in this way. Joy is a fruit and a byproduct as we choose to walk in the Spirit, choose to walk in obedience. It's there as we walk in the Spirit, we encounter the byproduct as a life is surrendered and submitted to the Holy Spirit. Joy begins to come out of our life. See, God doesn't just give this to you as you pray. It it works in concession with your willingness to surrender and yield. And as you surrender and yield, yield, it comes. So joy is more than feeling. Joy is a byproduct of the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, joy comes from gaining and maintaining perspective. This is huge. Joy, biblical joy, the ability for us to rejoice always, it comes from gaining and maintaining right perspective. Specifically, this perspective is knowing and getting a a right perspective on who God is, who Jesus is, what he has done for us, what he is doing for us, what he will do for us. And all of that comes from a greater understanding of the word of God. The more of the word of God you grasp, you read, you study, the more that you're going to gain the right perspective as God works in and through your life. Again, the more we know of his nature, his love, his heart, his plans, the more joy we can experience in him. How often are you in the word? How much are you learning about who Jesus is, his promises, his blessings, the areas of warning? Again, this is a game changer for some of us. Are you struggling with joy tonight in the Lord? Are you struggling with the joy of the Lord being your strength? Could it be, could it be that we just don't really truly know the Lord as well as we think we do? You know, the Bible talks about us going through trials, right? What's the purpose of trials? That the testing of your faith might be revealed, right? And sometimes as we go through the Christian life, we realize, man, I am not so much, I'm not so joyful as I should be because I'm really not living a life as surrendered and submitted to the Spirit as God would ask of me to be. Again, joy is more than a feeling. It's, it's a biblical joy is a product and byproduct of the Holy Spirit working in through my life. Joy comes from gaining and maintaining right perspective. Here's the last one really quick, okay? I'm spending a lot of time on joy, so we're gonna have to be quicker on the others, okay? The last truth about joy is that joy is, is the bottom line, it's gained through obedience. Joy is gained through obedience. It's more than a feeling. It's more, uh, we know that it's a byproduct of the Holy Spirit. It comes through gaining, maintaining perspective. But lastly, it becomes a choice of obedience. 
How is joy found in obedience? Because it comes to the discipline, the spiritual discipline of reading the word and believing the word over my emotion, over my feeling. Paul writes in, in, in Romans to the church in Rome to encourage them. He says, you guys want to grow in faith. Well, in Romans 10, 17, Paul says that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word, the word of God. It takes discipline to hear the word of God on a regular basis. It's not an easy thing. It's not a, tomorrow we all have work. We got to get up early. We have to get there on time. But for you to get up an hour early, 30 minutes early, to spend time in the word, to spend a good amount, that, that requires a discipline. But I guarantee as you do, you will increase in faith in the Lord. And through that act of obedience, what happens is you gain perspective you're walking in the spirit. You realize all of a sudden, man, there is supernatural faith that God begins to give you. You begin to experience joy in the Lord. So faith abounds. So does our confidence in the living God who's actively working and moving in us. So Paul commands the church in Thessalonica. This is God's will for you right now, to rejoice always. Are you doing that? Diligently faithfully, consistently. Now, Paul gives us a couple more commands, right? The second command that Paul gives is in verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and there he says to pray without, what's your Bible say? Ceasing. I remember as a young Christian, when I was a sophomore in high school, I read, I read this verse, or it was taught, I don't remember, but I remember thinking, well, how do I pray without ceasing? Like, that's crazy. Like, I'm going to be on my hands and knees walking to, to first period, second period on my knees. Like, Lord, just Lord, pray for me. And I, and I began thinking, well, what's that like? And I remember talking to my youth pastor about this. And he's like, just always talking to God. And I remember going to school one day and actually do that. I was going from one period to the next. I'm like, God, help me with this class. I hate this teacher. God, give me strength. Help me not to walk in the flesh and let me to walk in the spirit. And I just began connecting with the Lord. And I, it became a pattern in my life of learning to always consistently be in prayer with the Lord. Now, here's the thing that's interesting. This is key. It's not an accident that rejoice always and pray always are linked together. They are linked together with intention. And why is that the case? Because our uplook towards heaven will always change our outlook on earth. Always. The more that you get your eyes upon the Lord, the more you're going to see everything around you clearly. Our outlook towards heaven will always change our outlook here on earth. If we always seek God first in prayer, our outlook on God and the circumstance will turn out much different than when we don't. Always. And the only way to pray always, is to rejoice always is to pray always. Be getting right perspective, keeping my eyes upon the Lord. The only way to live this Christian life the only way through our struggles, temptation, hardships, failures, successes is by, by consistently practicing the idea of casting. We have to continually be casting, casting all the time. Are you good at casting today? I know what you're thinking. This guy, what are you talking about, casting? He's talking about casting. Anybody here like to, to fish? Any fisher men, fisher women in the room? Thank you. God bless you. Yeah, I got some people. I knew when I made eye contact with somebody, I'm like, yes. Yes. I love to fish, and I fished for many years. I fished when I lived in California, when I moved out here. And Pastor Ed always has given me a hard time about fishing. I'll take a, you know, I'd go fishing, I'd catch a fish, I'd be like, look, my fish. And, and I would throw it back, and Pastor Ed would always troll me. He's like, it's the same fish, bro. Every time you put that on social media, you know, your Twitter, your ex, your f Facebook, it's the same fish, Louie, I know it. And why do you throw them back? I mean, he's like, that. you don't throw that, you eat them. And uh, so he always gave me a hard time. But I love to fly fish here in Colorado. Casting makes all the difference in the world. Your ability to cast. So when you're walking a river and you're in your waders, you have your fly rod, and you're walking the stretch of river, what you learn to do is you learn to grid the water. You learn to break the water down by gridding it. And as you read the water, there are seams and there are little ripples and there is foam and there's all these different aspects. And as you read the water, you know where to put the line, to where to put the fly to get the best drift, to, give, to increase the chance of getting a hookup and landing a fish. It's very important. Your ability at casting tonight makes all the difference in the world. 
Let me explain what I mean by casting. 1 Peter 5, 7. Peter writes to the church. He says, casting all your cares on him, for he cares for you. How consistent, how faithful, how diligent are we with the Lord at casting our lives at the feet of Jesus? Because that's what he wants us to do on a consistent 24 hours, seven days a week period, casting our lives at his feet, our past, our present, our future, and everything, laying it down at the feet of Jesus because he cares desperately for us and your life and every part of your life that you live. He cares about all of it. And he wants us on a regular basis, to, that idea of praying without ceasing, laying it before his feet, our lives. And as we do that, our prayers become to God like the burning of incense as it rises to God and he breathes them in. That's the poetic aspect that we read in scripture of what our prayers are like before God. It's just burning up before him and he, he, he receives that. It's going, oh, it is so good for me to receive their prayers. We are to pray without ceasing, always. How are we tonight with casting our burdens faithfully before the Lord. You know, sometimes this is where, at least for me, where the problem lies in my own walk with the Lord. We can go through the motion of prayer. We go through the ritual of prayer, but we're not truly laying the burden at the feet of Jesus or trusting him with it. There's that old hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. You guys know that hymn, that old school hymn? We just sang it a few weeks back at our church. What a friend we have in Jesus. One of the lines goes like this. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. He ought to be the first one we run to in all things. So what's it mean to pray without ceasing? He tells us there in verse 17, church, The church in Thessalonica, the church here at at Aurora, he says to pray without ceasing. Is it just this idea of 24-hour nonstop mumbling underneath our breath? No, that's not what it is. The thought and idea is that prayer is meant to be recurring, not just occurring. It's not something that we just do every now and then, but becomes a normal practice in the everyday life of the Christian. It's meant to be repeated throughout our day, between us and the Lord. It's not the idea of constantly speaking, but rather, listen to this, it's not the idea of constantly speaking, but a consistent reminder in consciousness of God's presence, God's will, God's way, God's word, God's plan, and God himself in my life. He is on my mind all the time. Lord, what are you going to do today? How can I serve you? Who are you going to bring my way? what, what, What do I need to see for you to use my life? Oh, Lord, I pray for this coworker. God, I pray for my drive in. Lord, help me just to worship you right now. Lord, I give you this. I give you that. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Man, I can't believe I've been saved for this amount of time. And the idea is I'm having this constant communion, koinonia, fellowship with the Lord. That is God's will for you tonight. To be a church, to be a believer, to be a Christian in which you walk with him and you're just, you're always thinking and considering of who God is in your life at every moment of the day. I love that. We pray without ceasing. Okay, we got to wrap up, okay? I don't want to go long. I've got like 40 minutes and the timer's going to start going off, okay? Here we go. The last command that he gives us this evening, he says in everything in verse 18, He says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This is the will of God for you. It's for you to be a Christian that continually is thankful before the Lord. This is the will of God, to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything of your life, you give thanks. You know, so often when we talk about prayer, we often think of majority of the time, the majority of the, if you think of like a pie chart, like 90% of the pie chart is like petition what we need, what we want, what we hope for, what we dream for. It's all the requests that we have. And the small fraction of that pie chart is thanksgiving. I believe life would change greatly in our walk with the Lord if we reverse that. That 90% of it is praise and thanksgiving and a small fraction becomes petition. Again, I believe 
I believe that we must learn to walk with great contentment in the grace of God through thanksgiving and rejoicing in the Lord. How do we cause this to happen? It happens when we get our eyes off of ourselves and onto our great God. It's when we think of him more than ourselves. When we think of his goodness, his magnificent, all the blessings of your life. I mean, just like last night, I woke up like at two in the morning and, and I was thinking about this and I was like, Lord, thank you for my pillow. Like I, my pillow is so nice right now. I just, I'm just hugging my pillow. I'm just like snuggling. I'm like, this is a good pillow. And no joke, no joke. I was for that split second at two in the morning. I was like, Lord, thank you for my pillow. I mean, I mean, it sounds silly, but I was enjoying that pillow at that moment. I was like, it was like we had a connection, even the small things. So often we think of the great things that God does, but even the small things that we would be thankful for all that God has and is doing in our life. Oftentimes, the Christian approach to God is as if he were a genie in a bottle, as if he were Santa Claus, and we have to, to mark our, all the things that we do right, then God owes us and must give to us. But rather, when we come with an attitude of rejoicing, of consistent prayer, and consistent thanksgiving, it changes our relationship with God. The purpose of giving thanks to God regularly gives us proper perspective to an all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving, all-capable, sovereign God. When we learn to give thanks to God first, it allows you to pray according to his will, to the nature of God and the faithfulness of God over that petition, request, or need. We are reminded of God's faithfulness in thanksgiving. We are reminded of God's sovereignty in thanksgiving. We are reminded of God's love in thanksgiving. We are reminded of God's will in thanksgiving. We are reminded of God's nature in thanksgiving. Again, one of the ways thanksgiving experience is through praise. We learn to praise. In fact, that word, thanksgiving, in the Greek is the word eucharista. How many of you guys have ever gone to a church where they talk about the eucharist, Right? The Eucharist is the word thanks, thanksgiving. That's all that that is. And the idea is praise with thanksgiving. I offer God my praise. One of the ways that we experience thanksgiving is through praise. Praising God no matter the circumstance of life. Now let me make, let me make it really clear. We will all experience pain and suffering. We will all experience hardships and trials. We don't rejoice in the trial and the pain that we're experiencing. We rejoice in the God who's going to lift us up out of it. We rejoice in the God that though we suffer pain and death and loss and difficulty, that one day I will shed this body and I will forever be in his presence. I am thankful for that. Well, he will wipe every tear and pain that I've ever had, and it will be replaced with confidence and peace and hope and joy forever with the sovereign God. That is what we look to in a moment of great pain. Again, knowing the will of God is one of the most important aspects in the Christian life. You don't have to search far and wide to know what God wills for you tonight. It's simple. Last 40 minutes, we've been talking about what God wants for you tonight and tomorrow and the next day. Again, it starts right here in the Word. Well, Paul instructed the church in Thessalonica. Now he instructs us. He instructs you to live this way. Again, what's he say? Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing and in everything give thanks for this is the will of God. Guys, it's not some weird, mystical, Eastern, esoteric thing to know God's will. It's not some secret or hard to find thing. It's simple. Just look in the word. And then we say, okay, God, that's what the word says. Let me now go out and live it and do it. Let me end with a quick story. There was a, a guy who was on this diet, a really strict diet, serious diet, and one day he decided to, uh, that he would drive to work and he would drive around this area, take his time where the local donut shop was, but he wouldn't get too close, if you will. And so he shows up to work that day and guess what he has with him? He has this, like, this giant, massive donut. And all the coworkers are there looking at him with their arms folded and like, okay, Billy, okay, Bobby, hey, I know that you're cheating on your diet, bro. Like, what are you doing? Got the giant donut in front of you. He looks at them, and he says, guys, I know what you're thinking. I know, what you, but it's not, it's not what you're thinking. This is a very special donut. You see, I was driving around the area past the donut shop, and I noticed this huge donut in the window. And there, you know, I was wondering, as I saw that donut, I, it wasn't by chance. I saw that donut, 
And I began to wonder if it was the will of God for me to have that huge donut. And so I prayed, God, if it is your will for me to buy that huge donut, give me a sign and open a parking spot right there in the front. (laughs) Sure enough, after the eighth time around the block, there it was. The spot was open. Oh, love that donut. You know, it's interesting, but, but you'll be surprised at the conclusion of some Christian's day trying to figure out the will of God. It doesn't need to be that hard or that difficult. God's will today is that we would rejoice always, walking in the joy of the Lord today, that we would pray without ceasing, that we would have a continual consciousness of God and his presence in our lives, And lastly, that we would be those that give thanks, for he is good and gracious and is an all-loving God. Amen? You pray with me. God, it's our expectation to walk in you, that we would be yours. We know, God, you know all things things that we need, things that we want, the things that we hope for and desire. And we ask today, tonight, that you would teach us again your will for our inner man or woman to be those that rejoice in all things, to be those that communicate with you and pray without ceasing. And in in all things, Lord, to give thanks. Help us to know this. Help us to practice this in our life today. God, I pray for those tonight that might be trying to find happiness. I pray for those that are trying to experience true contentment in this world, and they might be trying to find it in a job, they might be trying to find it in money, they might be find it with hobbies or sports, and yet they are coming up short, and they are discontented in this life. God, I pray that we would look to you, and that you would fill the void in our heart, in our life, through a relationship with Jesus Christ. God tonight wants you to experience a true and, rela- true and real relationship with him. And it's not found in religion. It's found by way of relationship. And tonight, God wants you to give you his heart, fresh and new. He wants you to experience the joy that only he provides through relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. And you have to choose that to say, yes, I'll receive it. Yes, I'll take that. Because God can give you incredible peace, hope, and joy, but it's found in Jesus. If that's you tonight, whether you're here in person or whether you're listening on the radio or whether you are watching online, you can cry out to God and you can say, God, tonight, I want to give you my life. I want that joy. I want that peace. I want that hope that's found in and through a relationship with Jesus. And you can cry out to him and say, God, change me. God, save me. God, heal me. God, fill me. And as you pray that by faith, the Bible says that he will forgive you and save you and radically change you, just like he did my life, just like he did to Pastor Ed. He, that same spirit that worked in us desires to work in you tonight. But you have to ask for it. You have to receive it as a gift of God. That's found in Jesus. So God, right now, I just pray for those that are listening that you might work by your spirit and that you might bring people into this joyous relationship in Jesus. That you would bring a cleansing and a renewal in their heart. That you would remove the burden of sin. Even right now, as they pray to you, God, that you would work and move by your spirit. Those that are listening online, watching, God, that you would speak to them where they're at right now. Their life might be changed. God, we thank you for working in us, in spite of us. Your word says even when we are unfaithful, you remain faithful. So work and move. And may we take the things taught tonight, things that we heard, and that we would put faith to our feet and now go out and live it and do it with great joy in you. That's our prayer. We ask and we pray it in Jesus' name. Together we say, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.